All right. So uh, welcome to what is kind of turning out to be the marketing hour with Shaheen and Doug and special guests and you know, friends and family as we kind of have a good, 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 good fun with this. Uh, so let's do a little bit of introductions. My name is Shaheen Khan. I'm with OrionX.net. Uh, go check it out. We do cool stuff. We've kind of over the past like five, six years, we've come, we've become a little bit of an industry analyst firm on the upstream. So Steve Perno and I and Dano, when he was part of the team, we were like trying to do like industry analyst work, but then that stuff kind of informs the marketing work that we do in terms of interim CMO or whatnot. And then we also have a demand gen practice that uh, Cindy and Celia and company were driving, although Celia has just kind of moved on to do bigger and bigger, bigger things. So Doug, you do a little bit of intro and then Debbie, you uh, do a little bit more than uh, because, you know, we do want to catch up. Uh, I, I, you know, for the, all of you know Debbie, but for those of you on the video who don't, uh, Debbie and I worked at Sun Microsystems, went in recognition of all the great stuff that she had done and all the great stuff that she was guaranteed to do. She was selected to hang around with Scott McNeely, our uh, very, very uh, interesting and uh, just great CEO. And then, uh, you know, she's moved on to do great things and we'll let you intro when you get there. So Doug, you go next and then Debbie, and then we can jump in. Okay. Uh, I'm Doug Garnett. I, uh, yeah, I'm based out of Portland, Oregon. And I, uh, you know, I own a company named Protonic, but for about 20 years, I did um, advertising, new product introduction work, um, all leading to ads, but also built sales channels. And it's all this stuff around how do you introduce new products uh, with my former company. Um, these days, I teach at Portland State marketing, consumer behavior, and uh, advertising campaigns. And I'm writing a book on complexity, kind of complexity, science, and chaos, and what they might mean for us in business, um, especially from the background that we've all been fascinated by complexity. There's a lot of really interesting little tidbits you hear, but I, I'm, I'm still not very convinced we've had the right thread emerge from that to help us all do things better and in better ways. And so I'm working on that. And uh, someday, I'll have a book out. Actually, it's about two thirds drafted, but uh, that means there's still considerable work ahead. So yeah, you've done how many pages so far, Doug? I have 270 pages down. Um, that's a book are, to me. Know, eight and a half by 11. So I, what I read is that's about a 400 page book right now. Um, I doubt that any publisher will let it get out there at 400 pages, but uh, I also am sure there's duplication that needs to be, uh, um, I'm gonna have to go through with machete. <laughs> right on. I can I help. I can, I can help there. So can Cindy. Oh, <laughs> Debbie, you go next. Awesome. Well, thank you. Catch, to catch us up. Catch us up with your illustrious career. We're oh, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for making time too. I know how packed you are these days. No, it's great. It's always good to catch up and see so many familiar faces. So um, I'm Debbie O'Brien. I'm currently over at Snowflake as a Chief Communications Officer and VP of Corporate Marketing. I, uh, I started my career early on as a PR intern with the San Francisco 49ers. It's funny, people don't care what I've done in the last 20 years. They look at that on my resume and say, let's talk about that. <laughs> uh, so it was a great experience, but it was very clear early on. I, I was not gonna, as much as I love sports, I was not gonna make a career of being a PR person in, in that industry. So then I, I quickly transitioned and said, I'm in the Bay Area. Uh, technology is the place to be. So uh, I, I went over to Sun Microsystems, uh, just a fantastic company. Um, you know, folks that have been in the industry, they know Sun. For the, the younger people on my team, I say, do you know where the Facebook buildings are uh, today? That's where we all worked and, and really made a, a great name. And I, I love my time. Then I, I went over to SAP, really felt it was important to get a, a deep, deep software education, no better place and to, to work globally. So that was fantastic. And then on to uh, Informatica, and I got to work at ServiceNow at that, uh, that juggernaut, and then um, over to New Relic. And like I said, I've been three quarters in now at Snowflake, and it has been um, just a, a Herculean rise. And, uh, it, you know, I, I'm loving every minute of it. It keeps me busy. Excellent. And we're going to come back to Snowflake because it has been just a rocket ship with, you know, valuation out of this world. I think you guys have uh, gone way past uh, unicorn. I think you're starting to get close to kilocorn. Uh, it's, uh, or, you know, some other corn anyway. But, is there a picocorn? Uh, uh, picocorn is like where we are. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, the teeniness. But I think, you know, anyway, 
So let's start with Tesla. Uh, Tesla very famously claims to not have a PR department. They do have a celebrity uh, CEO, so that obviously makes a big difference. Uh, Marty Larson, one of our other PR friends who couldn't be on this, I was just talking to her before this call, and she said, you know, they do have content marketing people, content managers. So if you go like look up Tesla and what sort of uh, folks show up on LinkedIn and what their titles are, they get content. So maybe that's what that's how they look at it. So is it content? Is it celebrity marketing? Let's have some conversation about this. Who wants to go first? Debbie, you go since we're going to put you on the spot. I agree. Yeah, I, I think, it, you know, Tesla is obviously a great company. Elon Musk is into many, many different endeavors. Um, you know, if you have read Ashley Vance's book um, about Tesla. Another good friend. Exactly. You can um, see right in the beginning, he and Elon Musk sat down and talked about PR people. Um, I know they have gone through quite a few over there. So I think when you get to that kind of celebrity celebrity status and your CEO is on CNBC doing things that I'm sure the PR person did not sanction him doing, um, it makes it a little difficult to sort of control the narrative. So, but I think that's part of their brand, right? And I, yeah, I appreciate the authenticity. I appreciate that what he's doing to, you know, push the envelope at SpaceX, at Tesla, et cetera. But I do, I think it would be a very difficult, you know, if you're trying to help shape and control the narrative, um, you know, I think uh, your CEO is, is so much associated with the company. So um, great company, fantastic cars, but yeah, hard place uh, to do marketing and PR. Yeah. Rosemary is making a good point in the chat window that like 99% of Tesla owners are their best PR department <laughs> because it's true that they also have a cult following. So maybe you do have a celebrity CEO and a cult following and content that is coming and, you know, are good at clickbait, then maybe, you know, you can claim to not have PR, but I wonder if they kind of have PR, they just don't call it PR. Well, I think you there's know? this funny, I mean, first of all, there's this funny thing about marketing that, you know, I mean, I teach marketing in my classes as the big M and then the what's in the marketing department, because there's what we have to do throughout all marketing. And then there's what each company puts in a marketing department. And I think PR is similar. I mean, advertise all of the disciplines in marketing have this challenge. And I think over there, what, I mean, it sure seems to me that Elon is, is I mean, he's the marketing guy. I mean, he's the PR guy. And um, I don't know exactly how that trickles and what assistants he has that run around with his dictates, but uh, um, that seems to be the thing. I think the concern for Tesla, from my point of view is, that was a great way to start the company. I think that they've got three or four or five years of rougher waters ahead of them now that there's the Mustang, um, the Volkswagen ID series, um, Porsches uh, high end competing with them. Um, I think that there's a really, uh, uh, there's a challenge ahead of them. And um, I don't think that kind of chaos marketing is necessarily going to work as well anymore. You know, that it's kind of a chaos PR he's used, you know, build up a lot of uh, excitement. You know, it's kind of the uh, uh, Rory Sutherland talks about in his alchemy book that this is what Trump did well. He wasn't predictable. Uh, Elon is not predictable. Um, and uh, but at some point when you're fighting now against uh, Ford with an extensive dealer network, it becomes different. I mean, I don't know. I'm not sure. That's my theory. But uh, I, I wouldn't say I have a great telescope for seeing ahead on it. Yeah, right. I, I think there's so many larger than life personalities out there, mm -hmm. right? Big mm -hmm. one, uh, Mark Benioff, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it makes it exciting, right? But how much is he focusing on innovation versus getting lost in topics around moving to Texas, mm -hmm. et cetera, right? I, I do think the point of, you know, we all sit in the Bay Area. You know, it feels like a third of the cars on the road are Teslas. You know, how much of an impact is he having in flyover states or other places? Because right? I think the mission is good, but you know, who who is he speaking to? Um, mm -hmm. How much is he speaking for the company? Um, mm -hmm. How many other executives can you name within Tesla? You know, after right. uh, Elon Musk. Well, exactly. I think Apple had a similar issue, less so, mm -hmm. but but it's all good. these guys. Yeah. And not to leave Tesla too fast. I actually think there's one specific thing that that type of PR is not going to work for. And it's something really critical to them, which is 
they're building an incredible network of charging stations, mm -hmm. but we're not hearing about that in the general world because nobody's going to go to an Elon Musk event where he says, look, we added a hundred more you know, stations in the last week. And the press people are all going to be like, okay, I'm asleep. Um, but people need to know that. And so his style of PR is not going to get that message out, but it's going to be an important, you know, as a marketing guy, I look at that as like, okay, we've got to get more of that message out because it stands in the way of electric car adoption. But anyway, sorry. And I agree with you on Apple, you know, but should, you know, it's my question on Apple this week is, boy, is it time to get rid of their live event style introductions? Oh, I had a rant about that too, that we should talk about. Yeah. I thought, okay. I, I, I just think that Apple events are so overproduced and mm -hmm. the speakers are so tightly scripted that, you know, and of course, you know, like people were saying, if you can fake authenticity, you're home free. And it's really hard to do that. So, and it was just too much. It was just too much. And everything is like, you know, incredible, not just incredible, incredible. And everything is like amazing. And, you know, after a while, it feels like, you know, you're trying to like fake enthusiasm mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it defeats the purpose. On the other hand, it's a formula that works for them and they're doing really well. So, you know, maybe, yeah. Well, are they doing well because of it or doing well in spite of it? Right, because yeah. there's always that little distinction where they've got so much momentum right mm -hmm. now that just saying iPhone 13. Right. <laughs> so back to PR. So yeah. all of this Tesla thing tells me where should PR be in the organization, mm -hmm. right? Because that's kind of part of what that Tesla model is exposing to me. Now we are all are. So let's have a conversation about that. Anybody have a strong opinion on it? I can jump in with it, what I've seen. Um, I don't think there is one perfect model. I've been at organizations where PR reports directly up into the CEO, and I've been in organizations where it has reported to the CMO. Both work. Um, I feel like when it reports directly to the CEO, there is a larger DEI, ESG, company mandate, you know, tie in with the values, partnering with the CHRO. Uh, that that larger acknowledgement that there's a place for marketing, but there's an equal place for sort of storytelling, PR, communications. That doesn't mean, you know, but I oftentimes technology companies have, and maybe mid-size, have it report up into this, the head of marketing um, and having, making sure that your product marketers and product managers are your best friends to be able to clearly articulate what your products do, how they're better, um, because that, you know, as we talked about with, you know, seeing Teslas on the road, that is your best advertisement. Your products have got to work, right? Mm. Especially as you've bared out a market, you're a mid-sized company and you're growing. But, you know, there's there's a crowd that wants to understand the complexity, but there's a whole lot of sort of mid-level and folks that, you know, I don't care about the complexity. How are you going to help me improve and grow my business? So speaking at many elevations. So it, it, it works in both places. There's I don't think there's a one size fits all. It has to be here or it's not going to be successful. Right. Uh, uh, pop, 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 go ahead. Oh, no, I was I was just going to um, no, thank you for. Hey, hey, Debbie. Hey, Casey. Hey, everybody. Um, anyway, there were a couple questions I have to leave in a little bit, but there are a couple questions I was particularly interested in that you guys were posing. And um, I'd love to hear the comments on what is PR these days and um, also how PR agencies are evolving. I mean, if you, there's many other questions that you had listed that were really interesting, but if you could start with those, I'd love to hear that. Sure. You want me to jump in? Go for it. Okay. So I think PR is, you know, the days of old where everyone sat around, we wrote a press release, we issued a press release, you know, we sent out a few pitches um, and the media was abundant. It was, it was almost fishing in a pool with lots of fish, right? Um, that we would get coverage. Those days are long, long gone. Um, we know that the, the FANG companies are going to get a disproportionate amount of coverage. So everyone else has to work really darn hard to ensure that they are building up their media relationships. Um, this is over years and years, right? Not a, hey, I'm gonna pitch this person and, and hope and pray that they write about something. But you know, thinking about what the headline is, what the reporter needs, 
Um, is it, you know, would an infographic help tell the story? You know, what research um, you really need? And, and Colleen was so instrumental at, um, at ServiceNow in terms of how do we package up something where we have 2000 CEOs talking about a topic, seeing a trend. Um, really the, the objective is to make it as easy as possible on these reporters who are getting bombarded with a full story, um, putting customers front and centers. Sometimes it's the let the customers tell the full story. And if you are mentioned one time and X company helped me do this, uh, that is the, the nirvana. So it really is, and PR again is not just at the end of the day, you know, writing the press release, but it is thinking about company reputation. It is forming the story with the CEO. It's building the narrative, you know, your product narrative, whether you're a consumer product company, whether you're a B2B company, working with analyst relations, investor relations, it's very different than just, you know, single tactic, what it used to be. I, two by two, I mean, uh, so I thoroughly agree with all that. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I came out in the, in the days of let's go and do a press tour and you always need to get visits because you can see, you know, we're dropping into New York. And, you know, our schedule's tight, but we might be able to fit you in and you could kind of get meetings with that. But you know, now it's just such chaos and there's been such a loss of those kinds of outlets where you could just go and get uh, get that. Um, but I think part of what his, I, I'm discovering that's additionally frustrating is that the measures are far harder to know how to say we're being successful because you're kind of trying to get a conversation engaged, you know, the getting big press mentions and getting clear, you know, those things are a little easier to get to. But beyond that, when you start talking about how that message gets out in the market and circulates, you're into a lot of stuff that's really kind of subtle. Um, I've been doing PR uh, work for a friend of mine who does, um, you know, it does artwork. And, you know, he's so far below the radar where a lot of that stuff gets picked up that you have to spend, you know, we're now at three years in our program. And, uh, you know, three years in, he's seen benefit to himself, but it took two years of acting on faith. Well, that's a long time. I mean, I, you know, um, he and I, we're both uh, over 50. <clears throat> so, um, you know, we're at a point where it's like, yeah, we'll just try it and see where it goes. But I know working in a company, companies don't have, have uh, uh, much taste for, well, this will take about two years before we'll really see it come back. Oh, yeah, really? You know. So I don't know. And I don't know what thoughts you might have on that, Debbie, because I think that's been one of the tricky parts to me of the new world of PR. Yeah, you know, content is really important. So it's not just about the press release, but uh -huh. it is, it's around bylined articles, the place uh -huh. content, because, you know, you can optimize for SEO. We don't have to do the backlinks, you know, as much as we used to. Right. But Placing those pieces in mm -hmm. the outlets, you know, how do you achieve trending status on Hacker News if that's your mm -hmm. audience, right? Mm -hmm. How do you do a New York Times, you know, placed article in the op-ed section if that's, you know, where you're going for. Mm -hmm. So really there's, you know, if anyone can say, oh, I drove a story in the Wall Street Journal and that led to a $5 million deal and it's like, I want to hear from that person, please send them my way. Right. Um, <laughs> but you can, with content, do A-B testing. Right, we can see what reactions are on social media to say, hey, we promoted this versus that. We put some hate uh -huh. behind it. Um, so I really think of holistic content and that's not just written content, right? I, it is, uh -huh. how do you optimize for YouTube um, and other uh -huh. outlets? So again, thinking holistically uh, about, you know, where do we wanna show up? How do we wanna show up? Who our buyer is and what's the buyer's journey? You know, clearly PR does top of the funnel, but, you know, the, the content team can help with assets along the way as well. Customer case studies, um, you know, whether analyst relations reports up into PR, or it's part of it. Um, thinking about magic quadrants um, at, for preference and decision making. So I think that's really, really important because you can bring the analytics back at that point in time to say, mm -hmm. You know, and, and you know, where uh, share a voice used to be nir the nirvana, right? Let's benchmark ourselves against our competitors with these key terms and these, you know, if you did by geography. Uh -huh. Well, that only got you so far. That gave you a uh -huh. raw score number. You know, one of my, my favorite share a voice stories is um, 
I was at uh, Informatica. We, our competitors were some of the big behemoths. So, you know, IBM, HP, et cetera, much, much bigger. We did a, a very comprehensive share of voice study. We looked at our top 10 keywords. We looked at, I think it was about 10 countries and it showed IBM or HP or Oracle. Well, their share of voice you know, was generally larger. We saw a huge spike one month in IBM. Um, and you know, we're like, what happened? What did they do? Well, we looked, IBM had a pretty poor quarter. Their CEO blamed their software sales and their data quality, data management, MDM sales were down. That was on their earnings call. Well, it spiked. So without mm -hmm. knowing the tonality, it's like, I don't think IBM really appreciated that share of voice being driven up by non <laughs> poor performance numbers. So uh, you, you've got to, you know, PR needs to become, you know, more and more data driven. And I know that's a little trite, but it is very, very true. Mm -hmm. So looking at the measures of, you know, how are your blogs performing? How are your press releases performing? How did that research mm -hmm. perform? You know, did we enable the sales organization to be able to take that research and talk to customers? Mm -hmm. um, is it in our CEO speech at the next conference? You know, speaking opportunities are another opportunity. So if you, you know, whether you're doing monthly analytics or QBRs, um, bringing everything you have to bear uh, on, you know, how you're doing across content, mm -hmm. social, PR, AR, et cetera, uh, is incredibly important. Well, in a way, I mean, if I could jump in real briefly, that, that kind of brings me back a little bit to the Elon Musk question. Because in the world where we aren't controlling quite as much by issue of press release, it gets you know 100 mentions. Um, you know, consistency in content, in you know messages, in CEO speeches. As you talk about that, I'm like, God, the, this sense of consistency of message is really critical. I do think that that's the challenge when you have a personality-driven PR. You know, that you know when it's Elon Musk. God, he screws up every now and then in a really big way. And, uh, you know, that gets some more attention, you know, get, get some an IBM spike. But, uh, you know, is it really that helpful? I feel right. that it is any good, P is it any PR good PR, right? And then, <laughs> oh, well, that's the, oh boy, that's a long one. Um, no. I think you were just making a case, Debbie, that there is such a thing as bad ink with that example of getting a share of voice because you did badly and you get the, uh, uh, I want to invite everybody else to comment if you feel like it. You go, you know, you all uh, have tremendous experience that adds value. So please do. And some of the comments in the chat are really quite wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. Cindy, you had another question. Do you want to take us to that next one? Oh, I was just wondering. Well, well, actually, Debbie, you know, it seems like it sounds like the tactics and strategies for PR are pretty similar, even when I was doing it 100 years ago. But but I was wondering what's different. I mean, maybe it's the quality of content that's better that people understand or, you know, they can tailor that, you know, or, or maybe we're writing the reporter stories these days. I don't know. It, it seems like that's similar, but that was just an observation. I, I was curious how PR agencies are changing as well, evolving. Right. That Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Yeah, from my perspective, um, you know, it, people who say PR are dead or the agencies are going away, I don't, I don't think so. I think agencies are much more savvy. I think they have moved beyond just a, hey, here we're, we're helping write press releases and we're, you know, helping pitch stories. I think they're much so at, at one angle, they are they're offering a greater depth of and breadth of what they do. But then I'm seeing more specialized. Hey, this is a great crisis communications agency. This is one who is fantastic at getting, you know, DE&I stories out there. These folks are great at measurement. So, you know, I, I don't yeah, I don't prefer the one agency fits all um, mentality where they're doing U.S. And global PR because um, I, I haven't generally found that to be the best approach. I like working with um, specialized agencies mm. where I can sort of pick and choose and say, I know they're really strong in ABC or in this region. Um, they're great with CEOs. And so I, I you know, the, the agency model, they've had to evolve too, but you know, the cream is, is rising to the top. And I don't always think the cream is necessarily those large multinationals. I know tons of agencies that are small that do, you know, startup work, you know, that can be a shop of five or 10 people, but are fantastic. So it's not, 
you know, it, again, I think it's it, it's who your company fits with. It's what you need at that point in time. Um, and it's really who's on your business right? and mm -hmm. how, they, how they can help and, and supplement and be real thought partners with you um, as you're on your journey. One last question on that, and then I will yep. shut up. Really sorry, Doug. Um, keep, I, keep going, yeah. I was going to say, um, how important, okay, so people have a specialty, but how important is the content depth? Like, for example, Shaheen and I were talking, wouldn't it be interesting to have a CTO on staff at a PR agency, someone who really deeply understands the technology? How important is that? I think it's important, but I think it's darn hard to find. Um, so, you know, one of the areas that we are really uh, diving into currently is, um, you know, we, we definitely sell um, to data scientists, to engineers. Um, so writing for that persona, I think there are agencies who, who can cover it at a a decent amount, right? We can get together with our spokespeople, they can absorb it. But there's, you know, authenticity for that audience is really, really important. So we are finding that how do we maybe write up an outline um, and then have our internal folks truly put their name on it and their stamp on it because they have a different view uh, on life. So I think it is increasingly important to find those folks. And you, we do see journalists, right, moving over to agencies because they might be tired of, of right. that side of life. Um, and that, I think that's been a, a welcome trend. But, you know, people who can write at a great depth, um, it's needed. I think it's, it's hard. When you find that person, uh, you, you hold on to them. I think also, you know, just jumping in, there, my thought is, because I come out, I do half hour TV ads for a while. Right, infomercials. Don't tell anybody. Um, but I did half hour TV ads. But the question I you know get fairly often is, you know, how long should a video be? Um, and I love to use the Abraham Lincoln uh, quote. It's probably uh, um, not really Abraham Lincoln, but uh, somebody asked him, "How long should a man's legs be?" And he said, "Long enough to reach the ground." And uh, you know, I think that because I think that every category, every company situation, every campaign has a different need on content. And, you know, I've done a lot of work in specialty areas like woodworking, where, boy, you've really got to nail the language and the feel that they expect from that category. And I've seen a lot of stuff produced by people who are outside of that category and gone, oh, Lord, that just feels harsh and wrong. But on the other hand, you got to figure out how much of that's needed in which category. And I think it varies. You know, there are places where you really have to have that CTO on staff if you can find them or, you know, and I, I like Debbie's suggestions, um, you know, about, you know, getting the internal people to write because a lot sometimes they really have a sense of language and phrasing that you can't just teach somebody. Um, at the same time, if you're too dependent, if you how I put it, there's a risk in that too, though, because if you can't nail that, sometimes it's worse to try to speak in somebody's um, accent, if you will. You know, if you try to speak in their language and you really blow it, you probably have, you know, you might have offended them more than you've helped. And so you kind of, it's tricky. I don't, so I, I mean, that's my own thought is um, a classic marketing uh, evasion of it depends because I really do think it depends. You know, sometimes you really need depth. When we did, we did those half hour shows and uh, we sold uh, 3 million drill bit sharpeners through, you know, using a half, half hour show, right? People didn't even know drill bits could be sharpened. We had all kinds of things to overcome and we created kind of weird, huh? A whole conversation around sharpening drill bits. Uh, we got done filming and the guy, the uh, director <laughs> turned to me, he's like, Good God, we just filmed eight days of drill bits, and it was really interesting. Um, and that's when I knew we were probably on the right path. But, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's the question is, where is the content needed and in what way? Um, I think certainly for what you're doing, Debbie, that's, mm -hmm. you know, you're right. You're talking to people who just really need help. Um, so, so, Doug, are those drill bits uh, the product or the solution? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the I'm, I'm joking. We can move yeah. forward. <laughs> the, well, yeah. <laughs> like I said, our first problem was, you know, the first communication was a drill bit can be sharpened. And, uh, you know. That's awesome. So what else? Uh, if, Cindy, did you have more? Keep going. You're on mute, too. but. Oh. No, go, I mean, just the questions that you posed, oh, it looks uh -huh. like Rosemary has a question, but just the ones that you posed and the thing that were really fascinating. 
Yeah, glad glad to, to pursue them. And <laughs> thanks for uh, for the for the endorsement there. Um, so we talked about the you know we haven't really talked about the comms revolution per se. We've talked about what really how things have changed, and clearly one of the things that has changed in a big way is digital. And of course, that dovetails a question that uh, Jason had about how metrics have changed for PR. And I think metrics plus digital, they kind of go better together than metrics did in the past. So who wants to talk a little bit about that? While you're thinking, I will tell you that I am a very big skeptic of anything having to do with metrics, because I think most of the metrics that we have are looking under the lamppost rather than looking for where the data is. And I think that if you're Facebook and Google, by all means, produce your data. You have data. I trust that you do. But I think if you're like a startup, forget it. You don't have the money to accumulate the data. So you're just going to get the data that you happen to get. If you get really big enough and you can fund it. But my problem is that as a, as a CMO, as an acting CMO, it is extremely difficult for me to fund the collection of data. It's much rather you know, I'd much rather spend the money on pushing the funnel forward and try to impact revenue. So at what point does the metric accumulation help with that? Because to me, there's a jacks or better situation there. And if my marketing budget, you know, is like, like we were talking in a different conversation earlier this week, uh, and it was like an early stage startup, their marketing budget is like 10K a month, if that, right? So there's really no way that you're going to tell me that spending half of it on collecting data is like a really good use when they may not even be around in like six months. So I think that is, is kind of tainted. But with that, let's come back with the comms revolution, digital metric, and you had time to think about it. So who wants to go next? Well, maybe I can jump in and try to transition a little bit because I did sure. have a follow on thought to the metric problem. One of the things I ran into in mass market is you can't measure until you spend enough. Mm -hmm. And I would work with clients who would want to come in. I actually had one client come in and say, uh, I said, well, how much money do you have? We have 115,000. Oh, great. To produce the commercial? No, that's our entire budget. Okay. And you're <laughs> distributed where? Walmart. You want to see a noticeable national impact at Walmart with, you know, call it $80,000 of media. You won't see it. You just can't see it. And this is one of the problems I've had with companies is we get ahead of the game saying, well, we need to see the metrics. Well, you haven't done anything that'll give you metrics because it's a math, you know, it's a question of in some cases, you have to get enough movement for it to be to stand out from the noise. Let's call it that, right? I mean, you can't get enough movement, it doesn't stand out from the noise, and you can't tell. So I think that was kind of kind of tricky. You know, it, it, when uh, you were talking, Debbie, on the, the uh, tech digital and things like that, you know, what, what occurs to me is um, I think it actually is pretty, pretty interesting insight that the reality of what we do in PR hasn't changed. But what has changed is the media has changed hugely underneath us. And so as we scramble with what, or, you know, as we've scrambled over the last 20 years to figure out okay, so the media all changed, how do we change? It's really not that what is needed by the market. There's a great quote from, I think it was Bernbach that, uh, you know, we're, you know, in our business of communication, we're appealing to the fundamental human um, realities that haven't changed in, you know, thousands of years. That's what we appeal to. And so in a way that underlies everything we do. But when the media changes dramatically, we have to figure out how to do that through these new avenues. It's all about the chain that gets out there, less, than, less about what are we trying to say and more about how do you get it out there and in what ways will it get heard and noticed and all those things. Yeah, yeah and it, I mean, obviously the traditional media has changed, but everyone's a reporter now, right? Like who are <laughs> influencers? So, you know, what does PR's role look like in engaging with, you know, non-technical or people who are slashies? I'm mm -hmm. sort of a reporter and I'm an analyst, right? Mm -hmm. I'm or I'm a speaker out there. So what um, what does that look like, right? Do you invite them to press conferences, press roundtables? Or you know, are you pointing them to or pointing folks in your community to them to get answers? So it's a whole different list of stakeholders. Um, okay. So and you know, I think it's you know one of the big things that we need to get away from is also just a volume measurement. And I, you know, I obviously I had my my rant on share a voice. 
Um, cause I didn't like, I don't think that's the right thing, but does your team have a very intentional strategy saying, Hey, I want to drive two pieces in the wall street journal. And I want to drive three with tech crunch. I want to build up my relationships. You know, I want to get 10 customer stories out there. So I think, it, you know, and I know even some, um, PR agencies are, are be, are willing to, um, th- structure agreements around just non retainers where it's like, Oh, we're going to pay you 10 or 20 or $30,000 a month, but pay for performance. Um, I think these are interesting discussions to say, uh-huh. okay. Do you have something interesting to say? Have you done the research, right? Do you have a great content piece as opposed to, you know, hope and pray I have a quarterly release and you're going to write about my no widget being this much faster. You know, even the traditional tech trades, they don't want that anymore. Um, And so it really is that combining of a really compelling story um, and getting it out to the right people, you know, where where you used to say, oh, I'm going to send this pitch out to 10 different reporters and it's all sort of the same. Nope. Right. Uh, do you do media round? And these are discussions we're having all the time. Do mm. we do media round tables after announcements? Is that better? Do we say we're going to do one exclusive? Um, but the fascinating thing, and this was pre COVID, we'll see how things change afterwards. I did have a press dinner in the city about two years ago. It was super well attended. I could, you know, I couldn't believe it. We actually were butting up against, um, a an Andreessen Horwitz quarterly dinner in the city, um, you know, that just happened to be scheduled on our date. We're like, oh no, no one's going to come, but it was fantastic. We, we had reporters from the Wall Street Journal, we had Reuters, et cetera. So um, I, I wouldn't sort of automatically rule out physical things. Like they can still work too, you know, but I can, I can, asterisk, we'll see after COVID who, you know, who is traveling. But um, I think, you know, trying and experimenting on new things is incredibly important. Mm-hmm. I agree that, especially back with the physical, because I think the challenge with, I mean, we've seen it in the community industry, like aid communication range, where all of a sudden we decided everything should go digitally. Um, But sometimes we've made that choice for ourselves, what's easiest for us, when in fact, you know, with my agency, we made a brochure, it was a, you know, 12 or 16 page brochure. Um, But what it gave somebody is a physical bit of us that sat on their desk, and that is tremendously important or can be, right, in the right situation. I wanted to come back a little bit too to Colleen, I saw your note about content. And I agree that, con- I mean, content is incredibly important, but I think sometimes we have to sit back and say, in what way? Um, and, you know, cause I've worked in some businesses like um, in woodworking where, or, you know, basically I did a lot of DIY stuff. I did about eight years of products through Lowe's coming out uh, through our agency. And the challenge is that, There is a search mechanism where people say, how do I fix my microwave? But that's not going to be enough for you to get an interesting new product that should be noticed out there. And so we have a problem in some markets where there just isn't a, what would I call it? I mean, I think content marketing works well when there's a natural tendency to go to the web and search and learn and be an expert. Maybe it's a nice, it's, maybe it's helped a little bit in B2B because I always observe that in business to business, you've got somebody in the company who's paid to look for products like yours. And so they want to be smart and on top of it and the content feeds right into that thing. Uh, a homeowner uh, tends to be a little more on the line of, oh God, the kids are coming home. I got to get dinner, you know, I mean, all those things. And I think it, it's just a different role. So I absolutely agree. And, you know, I mean, long form, I mean, I love long form video content. People are always like, why is it 10 minutes? Well, because it needs to be, um, but. Uh, um, because it couldn't be 30 minutes. Yeah, because it couldn't be 30. <laughs> but I think it is an interesting, it's a, it's a little bit of a, you know, maybe like the legs, you know, long enough to reach the ground. Sometimes content is massively important. Sometimes it's extraordinarily important. Sometimes it's less, you know, and you have to kind of figure it out. Casey, you want to uh, tell the story you're referring to? Yeah, um, just back to Cindy's point. Um, Mm -hmm. And again, I feel like this is our son reunion. Um, It is. I have have a couple quick things, you guys, uh, to Debbie's point about the agencies. I just did it. So I'm in a startup, my first startup ever. Um, and I had to do a really quick RFP. I talked to 27 agencies. Wow. And I would say 85% of them were oversubscribed. They cannot attract great talent. Um, you know, to Deb's point, you know, a lot of them are specializing. 
Um, it's been really interesting. And so the funny thing where I landed is with Big Valley Marketing and David Bailey heads up um, content uh, for Big Valley and they're really just a great team of people. So, um, but I was gonna share a recent example of um, uh, just how important, because I've been a little bit away from the media relations. I've been focused more on brand and events. So getting back into, into the PR world, um, our CEO is really great about doing quarterly kind of one-on-ones and touch bases with key business press. Um, in particular, he's befriended um, Heather Somerville at the Wall Street Journal. And several months back, they had a conversation about um, you know, what he pitched this idea to her about how um, a lot of tar, uh, tech startups are really di ditching their office space um, in lieu of um, uh, offsites and bonding trips. And so she loved this story. So a couple of months ago, she came back and said, hey, you know, I'd love to hear more about this. And what was really interesting is our CEO, Oleg, um, we're part of uh, uh, AZ, um, we're part of the Andreessen network. And so we tapped into our network. He sent an email out to a bunch of fellow CEOs saying, hey guys, Wall Street Journal is working on this story. Let us know your anecdotes, what you guys are doing. So all of a sudden I have like 50 CEOs and he's like, and work with Katie. So I have like 50 CEOs emailing me. But it was really amazing because I was able to capture all of their stories, what they're doing, their experiences. I put it together, you know, in a great PowerPoint. So we met with Heather um, for her to speak with Oleg. And at the end, I was like, Heather, hey, you know, we have this beautiful package for you. Here's, you know, 12 companies and here's what they're doing. Um, and it was an incredible story. I'll, I'll put the story in the link. And, so, you know, for us to be prominently featured in a Wall Street Journal story was just we probably wouldn't have had that opportunity, um, but it just goes back to, again, the importance of, of uh, you know, the relationships with media. And a second recent one that I'll tell you is we just announced our Series D. And so now we're a unicorn, but that's not big news like it used to be, right? There's like hundreds and thousands of unicorns. So, um, it, you know, how do you rise up above that? And thankfully, based on a long relationship I've had with a Bloomberg reporter, you know, I was able to hook her and we did have some really interesting um, investors that that helped um, with our story. But I think that we probably would not have been able to secure an exclusive without that relationship. Um, so definitely it's In fact, fascinating how the landscape has changed. Yeah, certainly the power of the network, both on the Andreessen side and on the personal side with the reporters, but also the, the, the power of account management, because I think one aspect of PR that is not discussed enough is the account management part of it, so to say, because you know every relationship that you have, maybe it's relationship management, but it's no different than sales. I mean, sales guys have to have that. They have to understand who they're talking to, what the requirements are, what are they going to do next, and you know, and choreograph that, you know, come up with a pitch that is customized. I think that's another big part of PR that is probably even more important than it was before. And digital isn't really changing that. Let me ask you, Debbie, if this is a good way to see it. I mean, in a sense, as, as Casey was talking, what I'm hearing is what I found with reporters is the more you understand what makes their life better, like how do you play into their life, it, that that hasn't changed. Is that hundred percent. It's a relationship business. And this, this sounds silly, but go make sure you're reading their last, you know, month or two of articles, right? Like, have they recently written a book? Are you following on social media? Like, I don't think that's any earth shattering advice, but yeah. like do your homework, right? Um, make sure if you're in a bigger organization, talk to your colleagues. Has someone pitched that person in the last week? I, mean, I remember at Sun, we had a whole grid, right? Because all of us were growing and we were doing a ton of stuff that it was like, okay, no, we need to know that eight other people have pitched this person in the last two, like look coordinated as a team as well. Um, and just know that these folks are so busy. So pull it all together. I mean, Casey's story is awesome. She was helping, you know, she went above and beyond in her job and, you know, met with 12 other CEOs. Um, and that reporter, she spent the time that the reporter was like, probably doesn't have to anymore. And it's like, she'll keep, you know, she, she know Casey, Casey will deliver. So she'll keep her in mind in the for future stories. So it's just, you know, those one-off sparks can really lead to long-term relationships, but yeah, relationship is, they're not going away. 
Is it, is so, it fair to say too that the reporters have gotten busier in a way? Set, I mean, the digital age has just made their lives kind of hell from what I can tell yeah. because they have yeah. to churn so much. Yeah, one tech reporter told me recently he receives 200 press releases a day, right? How can you even like 200 emails, right? It's just like, oh God, is this a cover a company I'm covering? And like Casey said, like everyone's a unit, but there's funding all over the place, right? People have the best, the fastest, the greatest, you know, that not interesting anymore. So Debbie, talk, let's talk a little bit about Snowflake. And I know you guys have been at, you know, rapidly rising companies, but uh, how, what, you know, what is different with working in a hyper growth company that is in the limelight and a market valuation that is bigger than Oracle and, you know, you just go public and boom, like, you know, rocket ship sort of a thing. Uh, we can then come back and talk about the other end of the spectrum too later, because Cindy and I work with a lot of early stage startups where it's a completely different dynamic. So uh, let's speak to that a little bit. Casey, you too, since you guys are also doing great stuff. Yeah, um, today's actually our, our year anniversary of our IPO. So it was the, the largest software IPO ever. So that's something to be said, right? And we definitely um, long-term projections um, that we will be, you know, all things go well, knock on wood, um, the fastest co software company to $10 billion by 2029. So it really- wow a rocket ship. Um, you know, it, it, we had, you know, sort of funny story. Um, Oracle had earnings this week and, and Larry Ellison's coming right after us, right? Saying how much Oracle's better, right? And our, our founders were from Oracle. So they're like, if you had told me nine years ago that Larry would be mentioning us on an earnings call, I wouldn't have believed it. So, you know, I think there's there's a couple things, right? The, the technology is rock solid. Um, customers love us. We have a, a consumption pricing model as opposed to a traditional SaaS model. So you pay on usage. Um, and our CEO and executive team are very much, you know, Frank is a, a three-time CEO, three very successful companies, data domain, ServiceNow, and Snowflake. You know, he definitely has a, a philosophy around amping it up and doing more. If you say you can do, you know, 20% more, he'll say, well, why, why can't you do 100, right? So he definitely is a, you know, a, an operationally minded CEO, um, you know, he drives, he, good guy. I, I like him a ton, but he is an operator, right? Yes. Like what can be better? You know, how do we, you know, we're transforming and we're really going to market by industry. So we have more stories to tell in financial services or healthcare or public sector, as opposed to, Hey, we build great technology and let's tell that story. So, um, it really is fun. And, you know, I always love the, I feel like the Nirvana state is when your phone rings as much as you're, you know, calling reporters and, it, it's nice, you know, you do get to sort of you pick and choose and say, no, we don't want to do that. And it's, you know, I don't, you don't want to be egotistical and say, you know, big name reporter or big name public publication, I don't want to do it. But, you know, we, we are very choosy and say, is, will that, you know, position us in, in the best light? So, um, you know, it's fun. And again, there's, there's no playbook for what we do. It's like, oh, if you've done PR this way and just keep doing it. No, like everything is unique. Every event is unique. Every launch is unique. And you don't just sort of say, okay, write the press release, do a press conference. Uh, our worlds have completely changed. So I think it's fun. Like every day you come and you're, you sort of don't know, like what is the competition going to throw at you? What, you know, are, are the product teams going to come up with? What did the CEO do or say? Right. So you, we're, we're always on our toes. And that's what I love about communication. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you deal with what is always like a shortage of resources in a hyper growth company? Because the opportunity is awesome, but then you haven't quite staffed up and resourced to that level. So you're always a little bit behind. Uh, tell us a little bit about that pain. I mean, it's a good problem to have, but it's still a problem. Yeah. You know, I am. Um, I report into a fantastic CMO. Um, she's just absolutely terrific. She um, every quarter she has her entire team focus on a document called what matters. We put down, again, sounds simple, but we put down our three or four major things that we're going to accomplish. And this is not, you know, what's in your job description, but how do you go above and beyond? And so we are able to focus 80 to 90% on what really matters. And she has absolutely given permission to people to say, say no, don't do it. I think so many organizations say that, 
but don't um, don't actually live it, right? She's a I see. prioritizer. And so it's like, do you need to be in that meeting? Why are you having a call with that person, right? And so it's like, is that going to move the needle for us? Is it going to, is it aligned with our values? Is it going to help a customer? Um, is it going to make a difference? And so, yes, we are constantly growing and crazy, but um, we don't we don't have to say yes to everything, whether it's an internal request or an external request. And it, it helps quite a bit. That is I, I excellent. Like that. The, the VP that, Sh uh, that Shaheen and I worked for at Floating Point, um, one of the things I still remember from him is we would do these meetings where we'd get together and he'd just say, okay, we start with a list. And what I, I don't know what his real theory was behind it, but what I walked away from was if it wasn't top of mind, maintaining these extensive checklists that would keep all of us uh, busy was not productive. What he cared about was what matters right now. And so we'd start at the top and make a list and, you know, he didn't, you know, have anything, he, he didn't keep it short necessarily, but if it wasn't top of mind, you know, and I, I know there's holes potentially to that, but I think at an executive level or at this big level of like, wait a minute, what's going on with the company? I think it's really productive to, to be able to let go of maintaining action items from week to week when, when those action items aged out and don't matter anymore. Did you do that? Uh, no, I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Casey, you want to comment to it too, since you're experiencing? Yeah, gone are the days at Sun where you know we had our big teams and our big fat budgets. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I think I'm a pretty good multitasker, but I am literally doing the job of five people. I mean, it's my stuff. I run, uh, so I'm the vice president of brand and communication for People.ai. Um, I have one person on my team who's an amazing graphic designer and he's just wonderful, but he is like of no use to me on a daily basis. So I'm doing AR, which is my least favorite thing in marketing to do. <laughs> oh, like, oh, why am I doing AR? Um, you know, I'm rebranding. I mean, I've been there for five months and in five months I've done an RFP, brought an agency on board. I've brought a creative team on board. Um, I've rebranded the company in four weeks. Uh, we're launching in November. I mean, it's just, I mean, we are multi you know, We did a series D, we did an acquisition. I mean, it is crazy. That's excellent. Um, so I think you guys nailed it. I think it's a combination of agility. So yeah. you can redirect the resources that you do have to what it needs to be done. But then the part that needs to go with it is prioritization so that you do what you mean to do and not what you don't mean to do. And that's really, both of them are very hard. Both of them are very hard. Well, we're coming up to the top of the hour, so let's try to land the plane. Thanks for all of you to have the time and allocate the time and be here. And uh, uh, we talked qu about quite a lot of things. So I, I won't, I usually try to summarize. So I, maybe I will just for the video. We talked about celebrity marketing. We talked about content, the quality, the depth. We talked about how uh, the holistic content is becoming more important. We talked about metrics uh, and, um, and tonality and the, the details of the metric so that we don't uh, misjudge a bad metric for a good metric. We talked about A-B testing that things like digital allow you to do that it's harder to do with analog. Uh, agencies and how they're evolving. Uh, Debbie mentioned that you'd like to look at what they're good at and what their specialization is. And that way you have the quality and you can still leverage and, and, and rely on their bandwidth. Uh, content keeps coming back. So I think content, uh, we, we didn't talk about what's happened to the word story, but I think content and story go together these days. Uh, we, you know, we also didn't get to talk about the impact of PR on the funnel. Uh, is it really just the top of the funnel or is it really having an impact lower down, which I believe it does increasingly. Uh, last time we had a conversation with uh, Jennifer Hartman at uh, John Deere and they're like coming up with uh, AI infused, you know, lawnmowers and tractors. And that suddenly becomes like a social political discussion that PR needs to be in on, you know, even before you launch the product so that you're not, uh, you're not surprised by it. So I think that increasing the importance of uh, PR and content, we, uh, the impact of the network, tapping into the networks that you have to look larger than life, and then hyper growth companies, agility, prioritization. I think I covered some of it, if not most of it. So any uh, uh, last comments from the audience before I go to uh, Doug and Debbie to ask you how people can get more of you? Twitter, Facebook. 
Go for it, Doug, you go next. All right, <clears throat> so uh, you can uh, read the things I've been writing at my blog, which is DougGarnett.com, uh, cleverly named. And then uh, I also, I'm on Twitter at Atomic Adman. So uh, that's uh, from my old days, different from what I do now, but I'm on Twitter at Atomic Adman. And all my contacts are in both. There also is my company at Protonic.net, but Protonic spelled with a K, because I Pro needed it to feel more Eastern European somehow. Protonic, it's a more serious proton. Yes, a more serious proton, yes. Mm -hmm. yep. Maybe what is the best way to track your movements and content? Yeah, on, on LinkedIn, I'm uh, Debbie Willary O'Brien with the O'Brien, thanks to uh, Ski and Shaheen's help, uh, an, another son marriage that uh, one of the many. Um, and then I'm uh, Deb Willary, which is D-E-W-A-L-E-R-Y, which is my maiden name um, on Twitter. So, uh, you know, love the discussion. Thank you guys for having me. Um, I do, you know, closing comments, PR communications is more than ever, more important than ever, right? Like people that have storytelling telling great writing abilities, they are able to come in and have an impact. So I, while it's changed, it is here to stay. Yeah, absolutely. Well, wonderful to see everybody. Thank you and Thank look you. forward to more of it. All right. Take care. Great to see you all. Great to Bye -bye. meet you.